winter on the East Coast. It's notoriously volatile. Huge storm systems can develop with explosive speed and ferocity. Maryland is nearly bullseyed in that zone where dry, cold Canadian air faces off with the warmer and moisture-rich air flowing north from the southern states and the Gulf Stream waters. And when the jet stream moves overhead, this is a recipe for some powerful storms producing dangerous and impactful weather. It also makes for some challenging forecasting. I'm Chief Meteorologist Gerard Jabaley for the Fox 45 News Weather Authority. I'm here to break down the science of the cold season and give you the forecast for what I expect here in Maryland this winter. Runway 28, clear for takeoff traffic. Three miles down, runway 33 left. Last winter, the Baltimore airport only received 11.3 inches of snow, only about half of the average. But it was a very wet season with 15.1 inches of total liquid equivalent. That's nearly 150% of the 9.7 inches we averaged since 1950. And the reason for less snow is we had a season average temperature of 40.8 degrees, well above the 20 year average of 36 and a half degrees, and the average since 1950 of 35.8. Now, while temperatures fluctuate all season long between mild and cold, Baltimore's average highs through the winter months are usually in the low to mid 40s, and our average lows in the upper 20s to around 30 degrees. So, what do we normally see each winter? Well, the problem is it's hard to find a normal winter, but here are some averages and some extremes. Since 1893, Baltimore averages 21 inches of snow each winter. Now, Baltimore has never had a winter without measurable snow. In the five least snowy seasons we've ever had, notice that three of those happened in the last 13 years. Looking at the top five snowiest seasons we've ever had, two of those happened in the last two decades. Now we've had some years where snow fell very early and it was a below average season, while others it fell very late and it amounted to very little. We have also had some long snow droughts in recent years where little to no snow fell until after New Year's. Four of the top six happened since 2002. So does this mean we're going to have a snow drought this year? What kind of winter can we expect? Let's talk long range forecasting. It's already very difficult to be both correct and precise beyond about 10 days. We just don't have the technology to measure every bit of the incredibly massive, complex 3D atmosphere above us all the time. And even all the world's largest supercomputers working together aren't even close to enough computer power to calculate all that data into precise and accurate forecast models. Hot tea on a winter day always hits the spot. Forecasting for winter and months in advance is like trying to read the tea leaves in a thrashing, blasting tornado of leaves. It's incredibly hard. But there's some out there that like to at least give it a try. So let's get into some real science. The atmosphere is a giant puzzle of big and small patterns all over the world with nearly infinite complexity and layers. The challenge is to correctly analyze the most significant pieces of the puzzle, predict what each piece will look like in the future, and how much that affects the way the picture will look for your specific area. Now, the way those puzzle pieces fit together can paint only a hazy picture at best and only show forecasters if it's going to be a stormy and wet winter out west while it stays cold and dry out east. Getting more specific than that is still halfway a shot in the dark. Even now, modern meteorology is in its youth, and there are still so many misunderstood or undiscovered pieces to the puzzle. But here are some of those pieces we do know about. You might have heard of it, or at least it's opposite La Nina. But what is exactly El Nino and La Nina? Well, El Nino is simply warmer than average waters off the equatorial Pacific Ocean. Now, this is caused by weak trade winds that blow from east to west, causing that warm layer of water to sit on the surface of the ocean. But the opposite can happen when those trade winds blow stronger. It can actually cause the colder water near the depths of the ocean to come upwards. That's called upwelling. And that will lead to cooler than average water temperatures and the opposite, La Nina. So neither of them are big storms, but they can certainly be a big driver of big storms. Remember, Snowmageddon. 
the blizzard of uh, 2010. This infamous winter event in 2010 dropped huge snow totals. <laughs> Look, he's stuck. Two back-to-back -back blizzards hit within five days of each other in February and buried Baltimore nearly three and a half feet deep and parts of Maryland over four feet of snow, crippling much of the mid-Atlantic. That February ended up being the single snowiest month ever in Baltimore since records began in 1893. We had 77 inches that winter season, and all of this happened during a strong El Nino period. Strong El Nino and La Nino events have strong connections to weather patterns in places all over the world. We are currently in a weak La Nina period and expected to remain in this phase for the winter season. This can mean warmer than average winters in the mid-Atlantic. So, no strong El Nino this season means no big snow, right? Well, it's not quite that simple. So let's take a look at past La Nina winters when we've had some very wildly different snow totals year to year. First of all, let's take a look at the precipitation. Overall, liquid precipitation around nine and a half inches dating back to 1950. As you can see, almost all of our La Ninas showed below that. But take a look at the moderate category. It seems that that is far lower when we have a moderate La Nina. Now let's take a look at the uh, temperatures. As you can tell, here is our average temperature since 1950, around 35 to almost 36 degrees. All of our La Nina years that we've had that during the winter time have been warmer than average. But it certainly gets more complicated when the moderate La Nina is closer to the average and the strongest of La Ninas show those temperatures well above average. So all this translates to less snow during La Nina years. And you can see that our 1950 to 2024 average of snowfall totals around 15.7 inches. And well, we are well below that in all La Nina events showing less snow than average. That doesn't mean it always happens in a La Nina year. Take a look past weak La Nina winters. We've had everything from barely a trace of snowfall going back to 2022 and 2023's winter. But take a look. We've had some huge snow totals during weak La Ninas. 1995 to 1996, a banner bumper crop year for snow. We had nearly 54 inches that year. So there has to be more at play here than just El Nino and La Nina. Another big piece of the puzzle is the NAO or North Atlantic Oscillation. The NAO are the changes in the strengths of two pressure systems in the atmosphere over the North Atlantic Ocean. The pressure pattern is described by a low pressure center near Iceland and another high pressure center near the Azores Islands off of Portugal. These pressure patterns, or oscillations, affect winter weather along the east coast of the United States and Europe. And when the NAO is in positive mode, that means the high and low pressure systems are strong, and that forces a straight across jet stream, locking that colder air up in Canada. But when it goes into negative mode, the opposite happens. These pressure systems are smaller and weaker, and it allows a much wavier jet stream, and that allows shots of colder air to come down from Canada, sent southward, especially into the northeastern quadrant of the United States. And this can lead to sometimes big snowy periods for us. The NAO is one of the fastest changing patterns there is, switching between negative and positive mode about every two to five weeks. But there have been some cases where one mode or phase lasted for several months, lasting throughout the winter season. The NAO is currently in a positive mode, and I'm expecting it to remain in a positive mode for the next month or two before turning neutral or negative. This next pattern has a rather infamous name, but it goes by a more technical name. The AO is a large low pressure pool of frigid Arctic air swirling over the North Pole. But when that swirling weakens or goes into a negative phase, it can allow some of that cold air to expand southward into the United States, leading to the coldest outbreaks all winter. I'm forecasting the AO to stay mostly positive to begin the winter season, but look for a moderately negative phase from late December through the end of January which would likely send one to three outbreaks of much colder air into the region. If both the AO and the NAO are in the negative phases together at that time, we could see a major cold surge into the eastern United States. There are many known patterns, but also so much we don't know. And now there is a potential discovery that a new atmospheric pattern may have been found. 
While it is not agreed upon by many meteorologists just yet, the Lezak Recurring Cycle, or LRC, is being studied and peer-reviewed as a long-range predictor of weather patterns across the world. Named after my former mentor and chief meteorologist Gary Lezak, his theories could hold some insight into our winter weather. His LRC modeling of a cycling weather pattern is predicting a much warmer than average temperature and drier than average precipitation this season with only about half of our average snowfall. So my forecast for this winter season, 38 and a half degrees, which is well above our normal or average for the season. And for liquid equivalent liquid, including rain and melted snow, eight inches is all I think we will measure. And that is far below our average of the season. Now with above average temperatures, below average liquid precipitation, that is going to equate to below average snowfall. So I'm only predicting that this season, 13.5 inches of snow. So there you have it. But remember, the science of meteorology is young and very imperfect. Predicting the future is hard. Just ask stockbrokers, economists, or sports lovers. Right, guys? Why don't you try to predict the future? Because it's impossible. Well, who are some famous prognosticators? Uh, Aristotle, the Farmer's Almanac. None of them were right 100% of the time, so why does Gerard have to be right 100% of the time? I'd like to know that my qu myself. I need to know the answer to that question. Thank you, Agent. In the end, winter forecasts are part science, part novelty, but it's all in an effort to better prepare you for the season ahead. Sunshine or snowstorm, your weather authority will keep you informed this winter. I'm Chief Meteorologist Gerard Jabaley for Fox 45 News.